With me is Rhonda Goldman. She is a psychotherapist and researcher, influential for her work in Emotion Focused Therapy, or EFT, and Emotion Focused Couples Therapy. She is also the author of many books and articles and giving workshops around the world, so I'm very happy to have you with us, Rhonda. Thank you. <laughs> I'd like to start off a little bit with, with you, and I'd like to know a little bit uh, how it was when you were starting early on, if there was a particular book or author that really influenced you. Oh, okay. Um, well, I, I guess in terms of my, if I go back to my early, early influences, then Rogers and Pearls. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if there was one specific thing. Um, what comes to me, I suppose, is Rogers, 1957. Necessary and Sufficient Conditions for mm -hmm. Therapeutic Personality Change. And that idea of the core conditions, that, that made a big impact. And then I just think Pearl's um, Gestalt Therapy Verbatim, right? right. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. The S -salon. I, I just think, he, I, I, for me, Pearl's was so, um, so smart, just like, <laughs> His thinking and the way that he saw things and the way he saw people, it just made so much sense to me. And the videos are very entertaining also. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if I watched the videos and then read the books or read the books because I don't <laughs> the order anymore. Uh -huh. but, um, but yeah, for sure the videos made a big impact. <laughs> so you're like... Right? You're, you're talking about Pearls and yeah, Gloria. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And also, there are many, like, with the hot seat, uh, him doing gestalt with people. Oh, yeah. Those were amazing. It's very, were, very interesting. I those out, because they weren't so easy to find. Mm -hmm. But there are all these great videotapes of pearls working with different clients. And yeah. I was so impressed with his therapy skills as well. Mm -hmm. So you are the perfect distillment of emotion focus therapy because already you're bringing the two main yeah. influences. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so uh, I'd like to ask you because in this book, a book called uh, Bringing Psychotherapy Research to Life, you and your mm -hmm. colleagues offered a chapter on the life and work of Les Greenberg, the developer of emotion focus therapy. And you gave the chapter a title, which was Emotional Change Leads to Positive Outcome. And okay. that seems to really sum up the whole message of the model, right? True, true, true. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about this? Um, huh. Okay, well, I think what we recognized pretty early on was that somehow if you could get people to not just talk about their emotions in therapy, but to actually feel them in therapy, then you were then positive things were going to happen. And um, you know, as you and I have talked about, right, that um, if you don't sort of veer away from painful or difficult emotions, but rather you go into it and focus on it when it comes up in the therapy session that um, things can go well because clients when they are able to access painful emotions generally are tapping into things that even though they may have avoided them previously they are things that can lead to productive work mm -hmm. so um, and that's basically yeah, it, like you said, it's, it's kind of the tenet of EFT, emotion focused therapy, and also like been my personal experience, right? Mm -hmm. And then it gets a little more differentiated after that because it's not like all emotions and focusing on emotion just by itself leads to change because it's which emotion at what time yeah. that, that that's what, you know, we get more differentiated. And then also the focus on meaning. So the connection between emotion and meaning mm -hmm. is really important. So that, you know, and research has shown that um, if you can not just focus on aroused emotion, but also connect it 
with meaning and that if meaning can change, mm -hmm. uh, that this really does lead to change in therapy. So, so that's been, I guess, since I started working with less, that's been my belief, but then it's also been something that's been sh sh like demonstrated through research. Yeah, you, you did some research on the optimal arousal level of emotion in session. And mm -hmm. uh, maybe this is an important distinction that you already started to make. It's not just the arousal itself. Uh, you have right. to in some way integrate this uh, emotion and which type of emotion do you integrate associated with meaning. So th there's a, a lot here to, to process and a lot of investigation you've already done. And one of the ways me personally was also able to make a little sense of this is a book you co-authored with Wes called Case Conceptualization in Emotion Focused Therapy. Case Formulation. Case, yeah, yeah. yeah, Case Formulation, sorry. Yeah, which is a book I really like. And I'd like to focus on a distinctive feature of EFT that you talk there, which is the process diagnosis. I think this yeah. could be helpful to even therapists of other orientations, because EFT isn't really a person diagnostic approach it's more of a moment by moment process uh, diagnosis yeah. can you tell us what this is why it's important yeah 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 right so you know with emotion focused therapy we've developed this it is a process as you said it's a process oriented approach right and when we wrote the case formulation book it became an issue of defining what is case formulation in emotion focused therapy because it's quite different i think what we realized is that what cognitive behavioral therapy, what psychodynamic therapies meant by case formulation was something different than what we were doing. Mm -hmm. And that those other approaches tend to focus more on forming a view of the person mm -hmm. that's a more kind of structured, um, kind of initially, I think, static view of, of the personality and personality dimensions. Whereas in EFT, we are more interested in, you know, we have more of a constructivist um, view of people. And so people are always changing in relation to changing circumstances, right? So, and before um, they come to therapy, we don't know them, right? We only get to know them as the therapy relationship forms and as they, as things emerge in the process. So. Basically, EFT is very um, much, and people probably now recognize this, um, it's very marker-driven, right? Mm -hmm. So we're, when we talk about markers, we're looking for, we're, we're, we're listening for um, when people are actually in the session, what are the markers that indicate, okay, here's an opportunity you could now focus on um, their part of them that is being very critical of themselves. Or here's another marker that says, you know, maybe we could invite them in to have a dialogue with um, somebody significant from their past who's really influenced the way they see themselves and the way they have relationships now. So we wouldn't do that. We would we recognize these markers and then we at those points we invite them to work on um, things work on their emotional processing in this manner. So this idea of marker-driven is kind of now the cornerstone of emotion-focused therapy. And when we talk about process diagnosis, we're really, list, we're talking about how do you listen for those markers? Mm -hmm. And just two examples of markers, because there's so many markers, mm -hmm. right? I mean, there's, there's markers for blocked emotion, there's markers for, there's even markers for certain kinds of narratives, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So you know, if they're just telling the same old story, then that's a, a narrative marker. And it's an opportunity for intervention. So these are all, so when we talk about process diagnosis, and that's really what case formulation, at least in the initial stages, is about, is like hearing these um, markers. Mm -hmm. And so diagnosing the process as it happens in the session and mm -hmm. then intervening with it. Yeah, it, it, it has that little sense of the if then, if something happens then, it could probably be nice to go in this direction. Right. And it doesn't mean that you will always do that because there's a lot of other contextual factors that affect whether or not you do that in that moment, including, you know, client readiness for mm -hmm. that, and 
therapeutic relationship and you know where you are in the process mm -hmm. what you are in the session <laughs> so there's all sorts of factors that we could consider in the moment but yeah. And, and this idea that goes along with process diagnosis, I guess, is this moment by moment, yeah. right? That it's a very moment. We're making these decisions from moment to moment. Yeah, it, it, it does seem like this uh, really gave an advantage to the field in the, in the terms of clinical decision making. Because yeah. before thinking in this sense, you really had no way to figure out, should I go in this direction or in that direction? So what EFT kind of proposes in that sense is the ability to attend to these markers and know maybe I should go in that direction instead of that one. No, right, uh -huh. exactly. And that these clinical decisions, because I know that's a big question now in people's minds is clinical decision making and, and I think that's going to be the focus of next year's SAPI conference, right? Yes. So with um, emotion focused therapy, that clinical decision making is moment by moment, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And whereas other therapies perhaps talk about treatment planning and they'd actually plan in this session we're going to work on X. We don't do that, but we do do this moment by moment mm -hmm. process diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so I, I'd like to move on a little bit now to emotion focused couples therapy. Okay. <laughs> because before getting into theory and research, I'd like to ask you how different, what do you perceive to be obvious differences if there are any? of the Rhonda Goldman in individual therapy and Rhonda Goldman the couples therapist. So you're talking about me personally? Yeah, in, in session. Uh, in first, session. Yeah, for example, yeah. do you find yourself to be normally more directive in couples therapy? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think that's the key is, although I sort of think of it in, as active, mm -hmm. um, I think that because your goal, okay, so the difference between couples and individual is with couples you have two people in the room, not one. Right? <laughs> Sounds good, yeah. And, and so there's two people's emotional processes that you're now working with, not mm -hmm. just one. And because they're there and they have a very usually active relationship, I mean, you know, whatever, it's somehow a rich relationship. Then they're activating each other's emotions as they talk, right? Mm -hmm. So you're, you're now working with two people. And, you know, we have this idea that, um, and which is also, you know, fundamental to EFT, that we want to help people work on uh, primary emotions rather than secondary emotions, right? And yet people often in therapy will present initially with secondary emotions, mm -hmm. you know, like secondary anger, secondary hopelessness, for example. And we know that those emotions aren't so productive. So, and when they come up with couples, they usually are in the form of blaming the other, right? So one person will express secondary anger and that activates the other's primary shame. So you could look at that as it's an opportunity and it is, but you have to get active with that. And your goal, I mean, my goal is to try to help people to talk about their primary emotions with each other. Yeah. Whether they be maladaptive or adaptive, we're trying to help people to, with EFT couples, we're trying to help people to share those vulnerable emotions with each other. And, um, you know, in order to get there, you sometimes have to use more active kinds of interventions, like, for example, empathic conjectures, mm -hmm. where we, it's, and, and with empathic conjectures, what's important about them is that you are never invalidating people's experiences because you see their experiences as very real and meaningful and, so, and often painful for them. But yet, we also have a sense of what's the most productive emotion to focus on. And so I will empathically conjecture with the primary emotion that the person is feeling. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I feel like I have to be more active, otherwise, Couples engage in what we think of as negative escalatory cycles that just, yeah. you know, take on a life of their own. Yeah. And they become so unproductive that, you know, you spend your time calming the person, the people down, and then you don't have productive process. So we try to intervene in such a way, or I try to intervene anyway, but in such a way that I can help people calm down 
and speak to each other from their primary adaptive. So I think you have to be more active. I mean, I feel, I for mm -hmm, sure have mm -hmm. as a couple there. I'd like you to quickly walk us through because you have this five stage model in the in the FT couples and maybe I'll, I'll edit this to show in the screen the five stages. So okay. you, you start off by validation and alliance formation. That's like a classic in a sense of first right. stages in psychotherapy. So I, I liked you were now talking about the negative cycle de-escalation stage two. Right. And then there's the accessing underlying vulnerable feelings, which I right. already right. spoke about. And okay. the restructuring of negative interaction and self. And the emotional bond. Yeah. Right? Uh, yeah. Right. And this brings us to another question, this restructuring of the interaction and the self, which is these two focuses you have between yep. uh, attachment processes and identity processes. So right. I'd like to ask you if you could just uh, tell us a little bit about this dual focus you have on emotion-focused couples therapy. Right. So in EFT couples, that we think of people's uh, or people in relationship, their core uh, fundamental interactional cycles tend to center upon both attachment-related issues and attachment-related emotions, and what we think of as identity-related um, emotions and identity processes that have more to do with um, needs for validation and self-esteem. Mm -hmm. right? I think those are the more what we think of as the most self, self uh, <laughs> kind of relationship, and then attachment tends to be the more self-other kind of relationships, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, I, yeah, so I think what we are basically saying is just that these are distinct in, the, in that we, in terms of conceptualization and also in terms of working with these, the emotions associated with each attachment and identity, the processes are somewhat different. Yeah. And yeah. so attachment is, we still see, I think attachment is maybe a more fundamental than the identity um, in the sense that even identity for, forms in relation to attachment, but um, that both are important. And sometimes with couples, you're working with both. So, so I could try to encapsulate it best maybe by saying that um, attachment related cycles are more related to fear. They tend to have a fear base mm -hmm. and um, identity related, um, Cycles, or I should say, identity-related emotions are, have more of a shame base. Mm -hmm. So, in each person, you're either working with shame or fear. That's what yeah. I'm making. Just yeah, of course, yeah. And this will lead to different markers in session. Um, yeah, I guess you could say that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the EFT couples is a little less marker focused mm -hmm. in terms of it hasn't been specified as much that way. Yeah. But, um, because it's harder. It's harder, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and it's different. It's just very different yeah. than than uh, than in the individual approach. Yeah. But yeah, um, but I think how I try to talk about it is, you know, if it's a more shame-based emotion, then we're going to probably work more on, you know, helping people to self-soothe. Yeah. And if it's a more um, fear-based emotion, then it's helping people to uh, help their partner to sue. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the last stage, stage five, is the consolidation and integration. Right. So, so that's like when there is attachment and identity in an emotionally regulated fashion. Right. Well, by the time you get to the fifth stage, consolidation and integration, you help people to restructure the bond and not the fourth. And in a lot of ways, you know, just like all these complex emotional processes, these things don't just um, stick, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you make changes in sessions, but then how do you consolidate them? Mm -hmm. How do you learn to leave sessions and leave therapy and still engage in what are like more positive emotional interactional cycles? So we'll work on that more specifically. And this is perhaps where we get a little bit more conceptual or a bit more cognitive in the sense that um, we're helping people to really develop conceptual awareness of changes, emotional changes that they've made, yeah. so that 
solidify them and take them outside of the session. So it's kind of like meta processing, like understanding what happened during and trying to integrate that fuller. Yeah, yeah. And with a couple, you might say to a couple, okay, so this is your negative cycle and this is what it looks like, right? And here's what you do. You know, you might start to blame or criticize and then you would feel yeah. really yeah. bad. Yeah. And then you would start, you know, and you sort of map out. Make oh, it explicit, how. yeah. And then you say, okay, but then if you were to have a more positive interactional cycle, then that would look like what? You would express your fear and yeah. you would yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So then you actually have couples talking about, oh, this is what it looks like when we get into a negative yeah. place. This is what it looks like when we have a positive place. So then there's a sense of, oh, I have some control over this. Mm -hmm. I can do this. I don't have yeah, to yeah, engage. Yeah. <laughs> so sometimes you've uh, talked about EFT therapists as coaches, emotion coaches. So yeah. that's where it seems to fit well. Yeah. 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 That's where you're going into a more coaching mode. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, I'd like to, we're going to this end section, but I'd like to ask you about uh, a little bit about uh, training in this kind of sense, because you, you do train just not just doing skills like techniques, but also being skills and you have advanced empathy training and this sort. So I'd like to ask you what you think is the importance of this sort of more experiential being skills uh, training in students wanting to an EFT. Okay, that's so important. Um, so actually in 1988, Les Greenberg and I wrote a, a paper in uh, JCCP, Journal of Consulting and Clinical, and we talk about experiential, like learning to, it's called training and experiential therapy. Mm -hmm. And we talk about how there's this whole conceptual piece that's really important in the training. Um, but there's also a an experiential piece that's so fundamental mm -hmm. right? and so I think in order to become a strong emotion focused therapist you need to go through your own process develop your own emotional awareness mm -hmm. um, you want to be able to imagine what it's like to fit in the place of the client mm -hmm. we were talking about helping people to visit really deep emotional places that are sometimes difficult and painful and, yeah. and sort of inviting people to go there in, in session. And I think in order to do that, you need to have gone through that process to some extent yourself mm -hmm. and to be comfortable with it and to know that if you go there, you're going to come out of it, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so... I, I think having had that personal experience as a therapist helps me to help other people to go there, so to speak. There's that so expression. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's that expression I love, the, the way out is through, in a way. So yes, you exactly. have to learn that also. You have to learn that firsthand yeah. from personal experience, yeah. having gone through it yourself, right? This is the the person of the therapist kind of thing, right? Like this. Uh -huh you have to have had go through these experiences yeah. in yourself because there's a certain we also have a dialectic in EFT which we talk about being and doing mm -hmm. so that some of um, what we're doing is just staying with you know when people get into vulnerable emotions then you're really just being with them in that place and sometimes you're doing right we talked about markers and being active and that's more marker driven that's mm -hmm. when you're doing mm -hmm. let's try this come over here and talk to your father in the chair. Mm -hmm. But there's other moments where you're just being, and that being with is so important. And I think what clients will often, when we ask them post-therapy, you know, in post-therapy interviews, if you ask them what was important in the therapy, it, they'll say things like, oh, it was just that my therapist just accepted me no matter what, right? And yeah. I, so I think we know these things are so important, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. so, yeah. So, so if you were in therapy, could you describe us your ideal therapist? <laughs> ah, that's a good question. Um, you have a good question. Thank you. So, um, I guess it would be somebody who could 
help me explore all the I guess acceptance is really important, right? Yeah. And mm -hmm. lack of judgment. Back to the core conditions there. Back to the core conditions. And um, somebody that was skilled in being able to help me to explore deeper emotions. Yeah. That at moments where um, there were blind spots for me or um, difficult things that I was having trouble recognizing that they could help me to explore emotions that mm -hmm. I might, that would feel right without sort of shutting down the process, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Rather opening it up. Mm -hmm. That sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd like to finish off with one last question that I've asked all of our colleagues also, which yeah. is um, what advice would you wish to have received when you were starting out as a psychotherapist? Oh, that's interesting. Hmm. Well, I feel like I received a lot of really good advice. <laughs> so it's not like I look back and feel like there was something that was really missing. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, I don't know if it would be advice, but what I think is so important when you're starting out is what you and I have also talked about, which is that there's a solid, secure base so that, um, you know, doing psychotherapy isn't easy and learning to do psychotherapy is not easy. Because mm -hmm. it does take time. It took me time to feel like I was skilled enough to actually really help people. I mean, I felt like, oh, you know, for a while I felt like, oh, I'm, you know, good and I'm nice and, <laughs> and talking to me. But I didn't feel like I was necessarily helping them to get out of difficult places enough, right? Mm -hmm. And so that took a while to get there. And I think you need somebody who you can always come back to and who can, you know, help you provide that secure base that, yeah, okay, you're going to get there. You know, this is the process and you will get there eventually. Um, but, and it doesn't happen overnight. And there, but there is a point you can get to where you're going to feel more competent and more So a skilled. validating mentor, in a way. A validating mentor, which I have to say I was extremely lucky mm -hmm. to have mm -hmm. with, with mm -hmm. that. Standard. So, I mean, that's why I say I don't feel like um, that was missing so much, but I do think it was fundamental. So, how, how long would you say it took to you to feel that you were actually helping people? Oh, um... Oh, four or five years. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not. It's not like you know overnight. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was a gradual process. But yeah, I mean, I think after four or five years, I started to feel. But I also started out when I was very young. I think I had it started out when I was forty. Mm -hmm. Then it would have maybe um, happened faster. Yeah. I, I was very young, and at the beginning, I used to feel like I'm so young. I don't know. I need life experience. Mm -hmm. um, but so everybody's different. But I, so yeah, I, before I felt sort of skilled, though. Yeah. <laughs> Ron, thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> this was uh, really, really fun. <laughs> Thanks.